Hi, welcome to rule of acquisition number four. This is the utility imperative and the primary objective of science is utility. Utility meaning doing good things, making good things, putting food on the table, putting money in the bank, creating energy, useful energy. In rule of acquisition three, we demonstrated that we don't really need to know much to obtain great utility. In this video, I'll show that we don't even really need to know the truth to obtain great utility. And consequently, the objective of science should be to improve utility of what we know rather than concern ourselves with what, whether or not something is true. Odds are very little we know is true, but the concept of truth really is the topic of Rule of Acquisition 5, the truth conundrum, which is the next video. So let's talk on this video about utility. And well, before we get into that, let's talk about the relationship between models and theories. Uh, a model is a means to mimic a natural observation, and a given here is a mathematical model of what's called Coulomb's model. or Other people call it Coulomb's law. I don't. It's not a law. It's just a mathematical mimic of empirical data. Or another example of empirical a model is, for example, if we like Stonehenge. Stonehenge, uh, and if you model and observe the sunrise over, uh, I think it's 35 years, you'll be able to find the periodicity and be able to accurately tell from your empirical data that on a particular day in a particular century, that, or a particular day, you'll know exactly that the sun will rise at 7.30 in the morning. Okay, Stonehenge was such one such empirical model. It would at least tell you where on the horizon the sun would rise, and from that information you could deduce, you know, the, the sunrise time. Uh, and this is really only the only ut useful part of science, the utility, because from these you can do great things, and things that will accurately repeat themselves in nature when you do the experiment, whether or not the theory of is true or not. Now, theories attempt to explain nature. They're based on human guesses. For example, even though we have a model, mathematical model for relativity, that should not be confused with the concept that what Einstein says, gravity is the bending of space. This is just a guess. The model, you could take the theory of relativity and come up with any number of different ways that gravity could be caused, um, that it is the bending of space is one of many different ideas. And it, you know, so we need to separate theories from models. And then, you know, even though so this empirical model gives you the accurate time in the morning, we could put a theory to it that the sun god moves the sun. Okay, this empirical model of Stonehenge is irrelevant of how the sun moves across the sky because this is measured, observed data. Whether or not the sun moves across the sky, or the Earth spins, or whatnot, you know the idea of this empirical model doesn't change. The, the data in this empirical model does not change. So we need to separate theories from models. Okay, theories are just guesses and we'll show you what the value of, of theories are, but more often than not theories are wrong. And I'll show you some examples where even bad theories can get good good answers with good utility. And going back to the fire example, we you know, we used fire for over 20,000 years to illuminate our homes and cook our food, yada, yada, yada. And humans developed a working model of fire by trial and error. Hey, let's see if this burns. Hey, let's see if this burns. Hey, if we put saltpeter, sulfur, and charcoal together, ooh, we get an interesting effect known as gunpowder. And we were able to do, by trial and error, we were able to optimize the formula of gunpowder before we even had any idea of how to do chemistry. That's what Roger Bacon did. He was a monk. All he did was try different combinations until he found the best solution, which became the, the, the black powder. And that's long before we knew uh, what these chemicals were and what they really did. And so it did not matter that we had a wrong theory or no theory. We were able to attain great utility. Archimedes' principle okay, gives the correct answers only when ships are stationary. Once ships are underway, there's a squatting effect which causes the ship to sink down in the water. Um, and so, even in spite of the fact that the theory is wrong, um, it's good enough to develop the bigger ships and whatever. We just had to learn how to figure out how they squatted. That became an anomaly which we used to develop new models, Pascal's pressure model and uh, Bernoulli's principles. Those together explain all of buoyancy to include the squatting effect. 
and those models, those theories and models bear no resemblance to our committee's principle, which is just simply that the buoyancy acting on a ship is equivalent to the weight of the water displaced. So there's a lot of, come on dude, get your, get your fat butt out of here. Okay, so, you know, the sun god model is still useful. I mean, we still talk in terms of the sun rising and the sun setting as if it is the sun in motion. I mean, the reason why we do that is because it's easier to express it that way. It's easier for our simple brains to, you know, handle that concept. I mean, if you tried to explain sunrise and sunset in terms of the earth spinning, you'd probably get much more confusing you know, I wouldn't know how you would do that. It's probably a simple way to do it, but we don't have one. We'd see, we've, we've still used this old model. And this idea that we're still using the old sun god model is a credit to Carl Sagan. That's in his movie, uh, his video series, Cosmos. The flat earth theory still finds great utility with architects and engineers. When you're building small structures, small bridges, you don't have to consider the, the curvature of the Earth in those things. You can just assume that there is no curvature of the Earth when you do a lot of calculations and development for small buildings and, and small structures. Okay, so in there we use that the flat is Earth for simplicity, even though we know it's not flat. So utility is all everywhere, all useful models. And now one thing that we have to drive home here is that all useful models that we have are based on empirical measurements aka observations somewhere along the way and, and the paint example follows and that a theory that explains these things are more often than not gibberish let me use the paint example let's say it's your job to paint a room that's 10 feet by 10 feet and it has 8 foot walls let's forget the doors and windows for now and using geometry you can calculate that 4 times 10 times 8 is 320 square feet Okay, uh, but what you need, what we're missing with this is some kind of empirical measurement. Well, how much paint does a wall, how much square area footage coverage do you get with a gallon of paint? Well, to do that, you got to go to the can of paint and it'll say right here where the coverage is, and the coverage is 250 to 400 square feet per gallon. Now, how did they come up with that? Is there a theory of paint application? Is there a model of a paint? No. Some guy went outside, put down a couple, 30, 20, however many pieces of sheetrock, and sat there with a paintbrush and painted them all to figure out how many square feet a gallon of paint would cover. And they did it for varying conditions. Let's say, you know, we know, know from experience that if your wall is originally a dark color and you try to put a light color over, you're going to need more coats, and therefore you're probably going to get 250 square feet. Whereas if you have a wall that's already primed white, you're probably going to get closer to the 400 square feet out. Okay, Our answer here, of course, is at least one gallon, depending on, on your previous color. So here we go. Here we have it. that we can, Without some empirical measurement, the equations for calculating the paint coverage that you need are completely useless. Math is completely useless without an empirical measurement somewhere. Doesn't matter what you're even the we're going to show even the theory of relativity has an empirical measurement in it. So let's identify all these empirical models. Let's look for the arbitrary constants of relation. Okay, an arbitrary constant of relation can be defined as a constant that cannot be independently measured. For example, the speed of light is a constant, but you can measure that by measuring how fast light travels. That's an independent measurement you can make. You don't need uh, whereas these other ones are a whole bunch of well let me show you. Electricity. What did they do? Again, they put they took two two spheres, charged them to a certain charge, measured the distance between them, and they measured the force. Okay, and then in order to get all these variables to relate, they had to make an arbitrary constant of relation. This cannot be independently measured. You need charge, distance, and a force meter in order to, to measure that. You can't just go out and measure it. In uh, new electromagnetism, the new induction model, we put empirical measured data into a computer and told the computer to find all of the models that fit the empirical data, and we found two that match the data within the error of the measurements. Gravity, same thing, and there's your arbitrary constant of relation. Theory of relativity, 
Well, look at that. Gee whiz. That, that arbitrary constant relation is also part of relativity. Sorry for the blurry. I couldn't, didn't feel like putting it into equation editor. I just copied this from Wikipedia. Okay, so this is based on empirical measurements as well. And those equations in physics which do not have arbitrary constants of relation are those that are themselves arbitrary definitions. For example, force is mass times acceleration. And E equals I times R is based on this. If you change F equals MA, you have to change this. If you change F equals MA, let's say that you say that one kilogram is really this amount of material. Well, that's going to change what you consider to be one Newton. Let's say you're measuring acceleration in inches per second. Well, that's going to change the definition of a Newton. Okay, so that these are a definition. And if you change either of this, if you change this definition, all of these other models change as well. You have to change all the arbitrary constants of relation if you change this definition by saying that mass is now this amount of mass instead of one kilogram. Okay, then all of these arbitrary constants of relation change as well. And if you decide to say, well, yeah, we're going to say force is really mass times velocity, well, then you've got to go through and integrate all of these and add arbitrary constants on top of that. All right, so everything somewhere is based on an arbitrary definition or an arbitrary constant of relation. None of this, this is all based on empirical data. Okay, there is nothing here that's handed to us by God on stone tablets. So, but what we use theories for, like, for example, for the electric field, we come up with this theory about field lines, and we draw these little field lines that are just theoretical from a charge. And we use them with great effect, but they're not real. You can't go find them. You can't measure them. They're just a theory. We say magnetism has flux lines around a magnet. You can't see those. Those iron filings, you're not seeing flux lines. You're seeing how iron filings obey in a magnetic field. You're not seeing the real flux lines. I can tell you there are no such thing. These are just a model, just like the contour lines on a topographic map. You can't go outside and go dig up the 200 meter above sea level contour line on your property. These are just abstract models allowing us to visualize them, but we think, you know, but we've, they've been around so long we think they're real. Even when we say that the theory of relativity is the bending of space, Again, this is an empirical model. It's going to give you reasonably good answers. I, I, I can tell you where this is wrong from an empirical standpoint, but from a theoretical standpoint, bending of space, ether consumption, whatever, whatever, you can come up with a million different theories that fit this empirical model. This is an empirical model. Okay, so, but, so why do we have theories then? Well, Scientists attempt to explain observation with theories like sun god, gravity is bending space, attempt to infer a deeper meaning. But these are more often gibberish than they are useful. Theoretical explanations only have merit if they enable the discovery of a new empirical model or, which still, if you come up and you say, well, my theory predicts there should be such and such, you still have to go out and measure that and confirm. And it will have, I guarantee you, an arbitrary constant relation in there somewhere. So that is one value of a theory is to uncover other um, empirical models. Or by showing that two empirical models are based on the same underlying force. A true unification. Not like the unification that Maxwell's given credit for. He didn't lose any uh, constants of relation there. He just tried to show that one, can, one field can be de de uh, derived from another. That's not, a, that's not a unification. That's just showing that one can cause another. Unification will be showing that there's one underlying field. And I'm going to show you that in the, up, in the upcoming uh, videos. So, but the final ultimate result is to improve the utility of the models, which when you improve the utilities of the models, you improve our ability to produce energy, our ability to do wonderful things that actually help out our lives. Okay, but there's a limit on empirical models. Because these models are based on empirical measurements, they're only valid within the conditions in which the measurements were made. And like most of the universal constants were only ever measured within the tiny scum layer on the surface of the Earth. So to say that you know, the speed of light is a universal constant is, is pretty careless. 
It might be true, but it's very careless unless we really go somewhere else and measure it. But then we might be fooled because, well, I, there's a whole other discussion on that, on the speed of light being a constant. So the other useful thing of theories is for extrapolation. A, theorial, a theoretical argument may allow us to infer that a model is valid beyond the conditions of the original observations. Okay? That we say that light is a universal constant is based on a theoretical extrapolation. But this still requires confirmation, like I said on the last slide. And there's examples of gravity and electricity. Both of those models are F equals some constant times some quantity times another quantity over distance squared. But none of these models were taken to the point where distance is significantly small. So a lot of the times when scientists talk of singularity, they're assuming that as you go, distance goes to zero, you get to infinity, which is a singularity. We don't know. And in other words, if we were to plot this, it would look something like this. But we don't know if the model at a certain small distance decides to go like this and continue on. We don't know that. We haven't measured small enough of a distance to know if there's a, if there's a, you know, a little, that this asymptote is untrue. We have not measured this beyond that. And so there's no way we can infer this. But to say it goes to infinity is, in my opinion, ridiculous. I'm sure something like this really happens. All right. So, you know, theoretical extrapolation, they're assuming their extrapolation is that when you go to very small distances, you have singularities like black holes, if this were the gravity model. In my opinion, that's ridiculous. Nothing is infinite. And so therefore, I, I theoretically extrapolate that there is some kind of knee here where it continues and goes on the other way. You know, theoretical extrapolation still requires confirmation. So our models in nature are useful because they are based on empirical measurements, also known as observations. And, and basically what we said before, models mimic natural observations. That's what models do. Okay, scientists attempt to explain these observations with theories and attempt to improve utility through inference or extrapolation. However, theories are, more often than not, useless monkey gibberish, which have done more harm than good. Okay, but essentially, theories are an attempt to explain nature. They're pretty much just guesses. Okay, the imperative of science must be to improve the utility of models by replacement if necessary. Theoretical explanations need to be taken with a grain of salt, like conspiracy theories. Without confirmation, you know, you can use them to try to extrapolate or infer a deeper meaning and a better model. But without uh, experimental confirmation, you're basically just guessing. Okay, thank you very much.